Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'll probably ask for maybe 22 minutes, uh, according to my own estimation. Um, and um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, probably rush into my presentation today. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you today, albeit digitally. And I'd like to, first of all, thank uh, Dr. David Woodman for including my paper on the list. Now, uh, in the run-up to my PhD thesis, which I'm coincidentally defending this Friday, so you're all very much welcome to join me. You can find all the info uh, in this link. Um, I came across a problem. How do I assess the uh, reliability of Anglo-Saxon royal diplomas? I don't mean only the frustrating problem of uh, authenticity of individual documents, but if we take a look from a helicopter perspective, we shall observe pronounced patterns on the map and chronological graph. Um, are these a reliable impression of the state of affairs a thousand years ago? So um, approaching these questions, I took a course in statistics and published a lengthy paper with my preliminary answers. Uh, the novelty was my attempt to assess diplomas not individually or as series, and not for their Latin or vernacular contents per se, but rather as a corpus and a mass source. I've since presented some of these conclusions at Kalamazoo, and in the future I plan to rework them for an edited open access proceeding volumes uh, by uh, Editions de la Sorbonne. Um, at about the same time, Dr. John Blair published a most in-depth 50-page reassessment of Bookland. In the main, he argued that Bookland had always been a Southern English phenomenon inspired by continental diplomatic praxis. Um, it never, Dr. Blair suggested, took any good hold in, in East Anglia, Lincolnshire, and further in the English Northeast, where the title to land was rooted in oral testimonies. But even in non-Viking uh, Saxon England, um, I apologize, um, or what I, in my work, for simplicity's sake, call Greater Wessex, Dr. Blair argues that, I quote, Buckland had uh, largely lost its precise and restrictive meaning by at least the 960s and had no precise meaning at all by the 1060s, end quote. These propositions met critique and reservations by Professor Simon Keynes at the symposium last year. Professor Keynes emphasized the role of monastic archives where diplomas were preserved. He also brought up indirect evidence to the existence of eastern and northern cartularies, once seen by antiquaries but since lost. Finally, given what we now know about diplomas production, uh, Dr. Keynes couldn't see eye to eye with the notion that a royal diploma became, I quote Dr. Blair again, a prestigious archaism. Following this discussion, I realized I probably could join in, and this is why I have the pleasure of doing so today with you. So my aim is threefold. Well, first, um, I'd like to subject to your scrutiny my statistical approach to royal diplomas uh, before taking it any further. Second, I'd like to subject to your critique my contribution to the discussion of Bookland, which I've only now recently printed in my PhD thesis. And third, I hope to reassess diplomas in Bookland and, with due modesty, hope to offer some new insights to their interconnectedness. Let us, for now, proceed from the encyclopedia qualification of Bookland as landed property that definitionally came with the royal diploma, the book, and hence the name. Uh, the question at the center of my talk, essentially, boils down to the representativeness of the available corpus of diplomas, and first of all, for my intents and purposes today, uh, to, geog to its geographical dimension. I can, of course, and perhaps I am uh, mistaken, but um, it seems to me that this problem has not been given much space for its own sake. The problem of potential skewness is sometimes acknowledged and discussed, and on the slide uh, you can see the gist of some positions, but the problem hardly affects um, the ensuing studies. So now, before I go any further, I'd like to stress the word diploma. Unless otherwise stated, my focus today will be only on royally issued Latin documents. I'd also like to emphasize that the period of my today's talk is between the years 871 and 1066 only or for simplicity's sake, what I call, and many people have uh, come to call recently, um, late Anglo-Saxon England or late Anglo-Saxon period. Therefore, it is this period, this time span, when the West Saxon Royal House held the de facto monopoly on issuing diplomas, that my conclusions pertain before anything else. 
Now, uh, the total number of royal diplomas in the electronic soil, including those marked A and B, is 1081. My period of examination features the absolute numerical majority of this number, namely 733. There offers itself no way of securely knowing which overall numbers these figures represent. Professor Keynes once noted in passing that as regards the years 925 to 975, the available corpus stands for perhaps one-tenth of the original amount. On the other hand, Dr. Alexander Rumble, who um, might wish to comment on this um, uh, later, uh, compiled a list of 29 known place names of the Buckland type. Four of them are mentioned as donated in diplomas. So if we extrapolate, then perhaps our corpus is maybe one seventh of the original production. But I must stress that all of this is very hypothetical and conjectural, and so I'm leaving the problem to the side. What I can't leave to the side is the vexed problem of authenticity. I'll be normally operating with those diplomas that are considered authentic or to represent an authentic transaction. I base my judgment on the editorial verdicts in the British Academy Charter series. For documents not yet edited, I follow the sum of opinions listed in the electronic Sawyer, uh, although sometimes I had to make adjustments for the lapse of time since the publication of um, the list uh, in the electronic Sawyer. According to these criteria, 542 royal diplomas made the cut for all subsequent number crunching. I must confess, though, that I may need to revisit them a bit in view of a new 2020 analysis of Edward the Confessor's diplomas by Dr. Tom License, of which I hadn't known then. Finally, I should mention the very archives that Professor Keynes pointed to in his talk last September. By archives, I mean the ecclesiastical houses that had preserved original single sheets or their cartillary copies up until the dissolution of monasteries in the 1530s. Using the infrastructure of two online projects, I was able to list down 81 locations where charters were preserved at some point. Some were later merged or transferred, some were on the continent, and some are of problematic identification. And so by 1066, there were 57 active, active um, archives in England by my count. Now, let's project these figures on a map. The elephant on the, in the room is that the archives are not at all evenly distributed across the country. Uh, here you can see two maps that I prepared. The one on the left is where archives are actually located, and the one on the right is where potential archives could have been located. By that, I mean ecclesiastical communities that existed by 1066, but have preserved no documents. Already here, we can observe that the majority of archives gravitate towards Greater Wessex. Um, let us now add the objects of royal donations. From a helicopter perspective on the map on the right, we see that donated estates generally concentrate in the same regions as the archives. Well, big surprise. Um, thus, there transpires a um, prima facie correlation. The initial and most intuitive interpretation would be that land estates, corresponding diplomas, and relevant archives formed an inseparable triangle. If a king donated land in Shire X, it is with a great chance that a nearby archive would preserve an according document. That is hypothesis one on the slide. But correlation is prima facie not causation. We must ask if this distribution is coincidental or not. Um, in a flight of fantasy, we may admit a scenario in which the area was covered by documents evenly. An archive in Shire X preserved documents without any apparent geographic pattern or gravitation towards Shire X, and that is hypothesis two on the slide. Um, it is indeed counterintuitive, but there are several cases of a pronounced distance between a land estate and where an according diploma had been preserved. If the same held true on a larger scale, we should need to admit that the map on the right is not that of preservation, but of an actual donation policy. To rule out one of the two, I mapped all land items donated in these diplomas. I then made a horrifically long table in which I indicated how many shires away an estate lay from the shire in whose archive a corresponding diploma has been preserved. And we might discuss why this methodological concession had to be made later on. As a parallel cross-check, I performed the same measurement for um, further three categories of Anglo-Saxon documents. 
royal writs, wills, and uh, non-royal donations. For these three categories, I drew no lower chronological cutaway line since these documents aren't as numerous. So when completed, the data set included uh, 741 documents and almost 1300 individual land estates, or perhaps better to say, objects of donation. Sometimes it's houses, sometimes it's fisheries, so it's not exactly always apple to apple, if you know what I mean. So the results were pronounced and very unilateral, in fact. And again, big surprise. Uh, when looked at together, 64% of all charters in a given shire would relate to estates in the same shire as the archive, and 25% to estates in contiguous shires. That is 89% uh, combined. For wills, the breakdown is more evened out, but that might be because of how small the corpus is compared to the uh, diplomas. It's only 60 items we have so far. So as for diplomas again, 67% will be about estates in the same shire as the archive of preservation and 24 in contiguous shires. If we now switch the optics, we shall find that on average, 33% of estates in a given shire are known from diplomas from archives in the same shires and further 40% from diplomas in contiguous shires. So the uh, second putative scenario is thus non-viable uh, I grant that what I did is in effect a substantiation with a lot of number crunching and a lot of uh, labor intense work of the intuitive fact that for an Anglo-Saxon document to survive, they needed to be an ecclesiastic community nearby to begin with. But we can actually go further because even with the, within the archived area, diplomas are distributed, distributed hugely disproportionately. The two top archives, Abingdon and Winchester, lead only because of their three particularly long catalogues. We therefore may suspect that what we see is a reflection of the mode of preservation more of production. Can we somehow refute this? Can we somehow test the idea that West Saxon kings exercised land patronage not arbitrarily, but first of all, where they actually had resources, where there was land to be given out? In other words, is there any residue of the truth uh, from the first hypothesis I suggested? Uh, this is where my work uh, stalled for a bit, and so I had to turn to more mathematically hardcore statistical methods I learned from that course I've just mentioned. So one is called uh, Pearson correlation. The long and short of it is that it yields a coefficient in the range from minus one to plus one, and the number represents the linear correlation between two variables. These coefficients um, are also assessed for their p-values. That is to say, roughly speaking, the likelihood of a coefficient to actually have nothing to do with our data. If a p-value is above 10%, statisticians normally discard the results as potentially very much flawed. The other method was models of linear regressions. Um, it is built around a mathematical function uh, that on a graph will give you a curve which will predict how variable y will numerically change if you change variable x. The quality of the model is mainly measured with the so-called R-square. The closer it is to one, the more individual data points will align with the curve in the graph. In practical terms, if R-square is, let's shall we say, 0 0.5, then the model will uh, we built explains 50% of the observed data. Now, I realize that uh, all this mathematical jargon might produce the impression that you might see on the slide. So uh, I ask you to please forgive my poor taste in humor, but I will give some very practical examples to make it more illustrative for the ensuing discussion. So think of age and height. Um, the coefficient in Pearson's correlation must generally be above zero because age and height are obviously connected. But at the same time, uh, the coefficient cannot be one either because people's height is affected by other factors as well, such as, for example, genetics. So uh, if we then collect some data and build a regression model that I was talking about, we will see a rather linear re relationship. In this random example that I uh, harvested from the internet, the R square is 0 0.82, as you can see on the slide, which means that the model explains 82% of the observed variation. And if we look at the graph, we will indeed find that most data points align relatively close to the line of regression, that is to say, to our prediction. 
So I hope I've not daunted you so far with this uh, mathematical nitty greediness And to check my hypothesis, I first ask myself how royal resources are distributed to begin with. Now, I looked at the Doomsday Book and its data for Edward the Confessor's possessions, more specifically their values or the uh, valuit uh, and valet um, characteristic given by the Doomsday Scribes. I'll voluntarily, voluntaristically go around the details and just jump straight forward to the conclusions. Uh, first, if we put together all monetary values in a given shire, the monetary value of royal properties would moderately correlate, according to Pearson, with the sum total. I then ran a number of linear regressions, and these explained only less than 35% of the variability. Simply put, and translating into normal English, royal income was higher in more economically developed shires, but economic development did not determine where kings would seek profit. In other words, despite the lapse of decades since the conquest of the Dane law, two thirds of the royal resource base, by and large, stayed in Greater Wessex. So back to charters, how do estates donated in them compare to these data? The number of individual estates donated in royal diplomas in a given shire and the number of hides in them correlate rather all right with the aggregate values of royal manors in the same shires in 1066. But I reiterate, correlation is not causation. I ran two linear regression models to uh, test the dependence of numbers of donated heights and of individually donated estates. These models worked rather well, though I never got variance covered higher than 51%. And that is probably because there are other factors we're missing here. So again, simply put, um, the models I got could explain about half of the observed data. Um, to translate these figures into, again, regular English, if we, could have in if we could have increased Edward the Confessor's income in a given shire by, let's say, 100 pounds, then in 51% of cases, the number of hides he and his predecessors since 871 had together donated would have increased by almost 94. And in 39% of cases, the number of individual estates would have risen by almost six. If we take the example of height and age and plot these data on the graph, we will see these figures. I mentioned the problem that Abingdon and Winchester contain a disproportionate number of diplomas. And as you can see on these diagrams, Wiltshire, Hampshire and Berkshire divert strongest in both estimations. So can this be on account of the exceptionally large cartilaries just mentioned? To test this suspicion, I just removed the data from the uh, models I was running, and this made the models just dysfunctional. Uh, none of the checkup parameters worked. The result was just as negative if I removed the three deviating series themselves, um, not series, shires. Um, the models just stopped functioning at all. So the models that I'm presenting are not perfect at all, uh, and they do not explain the data that are set ideally. But nevertheless, uh, the data are just too unilateral to uh, suspect um, some um, coincidence. So what I'm getting at is this. On the one hand, Professor Keynes must be right that uh, when he objected to the idea of royal diplomas not circulating in the Dane law, if argued diplomatically or diplomaticiously, I guess, simply there could have been a lot of diplomas that never sank in the archives because there were so few in the area to begin with. But on the other hand, conversely, in the area where there used to be many archival hotspots, donations clustered a lot in central Wessex or in historical Wessex, though there were archival possibilities for documents to get deposited elsewhere. And this, in fact, contrarily, grist for Dr. Blair's mill in the late Anglo-Saxon period Royal land donations recorded on parchment do, do have a pronounced regional bias. With such imperfect models as above, it's hard to measure, but to deny it would be unreasonable. And this is where I turn to the second item of the day, the bookland. What my analysis so far, I hope, has shown is that royal diplomas at, as titles to land likely saw use of various intensity from shire to shire. No more no less. Does it mean, though, that in shires of lesser diplomatic land uh, conveyance, Bookland was completely unknown? 
I humbly believe that Dr. Blair crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's concerning the problematic Falkland. But what his article took for granted was the definition of bookland. And this is where some problems may in fact begin. The word itself is registered only 47 times in the Old English corpus, and of them elucidating are just a handful. The late Dr. Patrick Wormald famous, famously and publicly characterized Bookland as, I quote, one of the most fearsome devices on the Anglo-Saxonist workbench, um, as you can see in my illustration on the slide. But he himself meticulously and in his own way elegantly crowned a long series of studies of Bookland that um, we're all familiar with, which you can see on the slide, and I don't think we will need to reiterate. Um, and this is where there are a lot of problems if we start looking at individual cases, um, such as book lines could be confiscated, reshuffled, annulled. So basically what they say is not what they mean, and what they mean is not exactly what they say. Um, the assumption that Bookland is essentially a land always donated with a royal diploma very often hinges upon the definition of the word book, uh, which is sometimes taken to mean a royal diploma and which is not the case. Um, so another problem is how it all depends on the antithetical lone land and Falkland. Like I said, Falkland is explained by Dr. Blair and quite persuasively as uh, fiscal land. Loaned lands, I believe, in practice, um, only differed in that they seem to have uh, been expected to revert to the lesser at the expiration of a lease or an account of a leaseholder's crime. So uh, many of such stumpers have been recognized before, and to me they suggest that it is worthwhile to view Anglo-Saxon tenural forms less as discrete and mutually exclusive and more as located along some sort of spectrum of greater or lesser freedom from encumbrance with some transitional gray zones. Now I'm reaching the conclusion of my paper and an aspect that I'd like to draw your attention to, um, and that is the uh, aspect of sociolinguistics. If we look at how the freest tenures on the spectrum and the holders are described, we will observe certain synonyms in parallel, which I list in this slide. For example, Landrika for the holder and Sako and Sokun for the juridical privilege uh, of the title. These were in origins coined in the Dane law, and like the, uh, the bookland, which indeed was a Saxon word before anything else. And I argue in my PhD thesis that where Saxon kings and their staff referred to such landlords as king's thanes and to their lands as bookland, and this reflected less a meaningful juridical distinction and more the language of power, the, uh, the mode of description. So I also argue that uh, kings seem to have cared less for the various modes of description and more for the actual burdens they could impose on these people and their holdings. Now, I don't expect you to read all the uh, information I framed on this slide. This is only to show that I did my homework. And so the process I'm talking about today is probably um, to be ca counted from King Alfred the Great's reign. And it, I believe it was then quickly brought to the Dane law on the swords of King Edward's army in the 910s and 920s. I'm proposing an argument that Bookland did not at all lose its semantic or lexical force in late Anglo-Saxon England. It rather got fossilized as a specifically Southern English and importantly a traditional monarchocentric lexical tool. It was used to refer to the most privileged tenures on the spectrum of freedom that could also go under other names and enjoy multiple modes of description. So was Bookland absent from the Dane law? The answer, at least from my perspective, is paradoxically yes and no. Yes, in the sense that if uh, the models that I built and interpret statis um, in terms of statistics correctly, Bookland in the scholarly sense conveyed uh, a land conveyed with a royal diploma seems a, uh, to be a relative rarity here in the Dane law. But also no, in the sense that kings established the same jurisdiction and rights over the freest tenures and their masters that, uh, as they claimed in Wessex regardless. So um, I guess it all depends on who's writing and who's asking the question. With that, um, I believe I've uh, expired my uh, time and um, I'm looking forward to any common suggestions and critique. So uh, thank you very much.